uh, Ben and Catherine, and Catherine too. And there we are trying to record. Uh, just saying how important I think it is for the parishes to get together and what um, a unique position parishes hold. Uh, you know, they're at the heart of the community. And if we can all work together, um, I can see that as, as a very positive way of helping with climate change. Um, as you say, uh, John Short and Jerome Mascat uh, in Effingham have been brilliant with uh, doing a template for how we could all uh, cooperate together. Um, uh, I don't think all parishes have decla declared a climate emergency yet. And I thought that might be a good first step. Um, as I say, um, uh, Effingham has, has done that already. And the way they've done it, it's been very helpful, very useful to use. Um, so uh, yes, every parish will be slightly different, of course, but um, uh, on a micro level, but overall the macro strategy is really important and it should be joined up. Uh, projects, as you mentioned, Catherine, the EV charging, um, and uh, micro gen uh, energy generation that's going to be important for all of us, uh, air and water pollution, exchanging learnings and sharing equipment. Um, I'd certainly be supportive of having more meetings for all the parishes if that was being contemplated. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's probably, I mean, if you want to know about Ace Tillingbourne, what we're interested in the moment at the moment is micro generation of power um, and uh, also the EV charging and we're looking into um, water pollution. There are, there are big gaps, um, you know, the government has the environmental agency, but they don't have the staff to, uh, to, uh, to be able to police everything that goes on. So it's very important for us to be able to test the water, just as it is to be able to test the air. So there you are, that's, uh, that's my contribution. Thank you very much for, for letting me speak. Have we got anyone from Effingham here? Because I don't think Jerome is um, actually here. No, doesn't look like it. Give me two secs. Sorry, go on, who was that? Oh, hi, this is uh, Bupinder, Ben. Hi, yeah. so, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Uh, so I, I, I'm part of the, the EFRA committee in Effingham and uh, so Jerome and I have been uh, talking about uh, climate change and the environment and the impact. And we've been focusing on a number of things. We did, uh, we, we, we sent out a survey about six months ago and the results of that were quite, uh, well, actually quite, quite illuminating because they showed that people were interested in the environment. They were interested in, in exactly what was happening in terms of the climate change. And they did want to change the way that uh, they, when I say live, uh, their behavior. And uh, one of the things that we're doing at the moment is, 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 is more recycling. And we, we're looking at uh, ways to introduce terracycling into, into the village, so talking with the KGV. And we're also pursuing, uh, I, I heard the, uh, the lady just before me talk about uh, uh, community uh, energy generation. And that's something that I would like to explore further. So, so those are the things that we've got on the, on the table at the moment. I'm happy to discuss, uh, really would like to discuss what is happening in the other parishes, because I, I know that in terms of the, the Horsley piece, they, they also did an environmental survey and I was planning to meet up with, uh, with the, the gentleman, but uh, uh, with COVID and everything else, it's, it's just been put, put back. So happy to proceed in terms, of, uh, in terms of more meetings and just more sharing. Thanks, Bupinder. Um, so in, interestingly, actually, um, there's an organisation called Community Energy South, if, if anybody's heard of them. They, um, I'm going to go into a workshop next Thursday, quite a long workshop um, with them to try and find out a little bit more. But they are um, uh, proposing to roll out some mentors across the southeast and looking at um, Zero as being one of those that gets trained up as a mentor so that we can pr provide a lot more information and advice on community energy so I'm, I'm hoping given that there's clearly quite a lot of support for that here among all three parishes that have spoken so far that that could be something that's a pretty good focal point for for moving forward and obviously with parishes being able to manage land um then there is some potentially good um good areas to to try and explore that just bear with me for two seconds um kate's here i'm just going to chat to her for a sec
Um, I'm putting Kate Taylor on the spot here, who holds the, um, she's just recovering from COVID, so go easy on her, um, hasn't prepared anything, but she holds the climate portfolio for um, Guildford Borough Council. So just sort of feeding in um, about what GBC are trying to do. Do you want to come and sure. walk around and sit here? Sorry, it's quite warm actually. <laughs> now. Um, hi. Um, yeah, sorry. Sorry I was late to start with and um, I'm really really pleased to see all of the parishes getting together and the communication um, expanding. Thank you Catherine, thank you Diana and thank you anyone else that um, has been involved. Um, it's great. Um, there are what GBC is doing, I mean at the moment GBC is predominantly concentrating upon its own, um, its own carbon emissions and its own uh, so it's in-house um, looking at that and assessing it and bringing that down. We've got a big difficulty insofar as we don't have a climate change officer at the moment. Um, it's one's being appointed and um, hopefully that will start soon. But I think our approach, GBC's approach needs to be uh, wider than that. It needs to be looking at how we can help and how we can facilitate what individuals are doing, what uh, Carbon Zero are doing, um, zero carbon Guildford rather, and, um, and what the parishes are doing. So um, that's really, that's, yeah, um, I've, I've been hearing a lot of uh, conflicting information recently. So I'm having, um, not from within Guildford, but from contractors and things like that. So I'm um, going to test Ben's knowledge later um, and see where we go. Um, but uh, yes, I haven't really, yeah. <laughs> One of the, my biggest concerns is that um, on all of the information that I look at, it is our consumerism that is driving a lot of this. Um, and I really want to find ways of uh, getting that out there, getting that message out there, because if we don't do that, the other things that we're doing are just really going to melt into um, almost, not, not into insignificance because we have to do them, but they're just not gonna have the impact that we would like. Is that okay? Yep, sorry. You didn't need that. No one on the line knows that you were late, so you could have got away with that without saying. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's a really valid point, obviously. Um, firstly, about consumerism, obviously, that it's really difficult for government or local authorities to tell people how to live. Obviously, we've seen what that's, that's done with COVID. It's people's natural instinct to not particularly care for that. Um, so building that community-led approach out to that is, I think, really important. And interacting with your neighbours um, can be, can, and your local community can be a really good way to do that. But on GBC's emissions, for pretty much every borough in Surrey, um, the operational emissions are about one percent of a borough's emissions. So it's actually a really tiny proportion. So while GBC's focused on that, obviously we're losing time of managing to cut emissions for the for the um, for the borough as a whole. So it's really important that we start trying to take action in ways that that we can do. And actually, you, ca you can't see it now because you guys are all on it. But normally, this wall that you're on at the moment um, is is a wall based on research which came out of the climate um, policy writing organisation C40. And um, um, what the guy who created it um, spent a year looking at what communities can do right now without government intervention to reduce an area's emissions. And surprisingly, it turned out to be about 30% of an area's emissions that you can um, lower by six main uh, areas of focus. And they obviously come down to sort of travel, um, fashion, what you eat. Um, so a lot of consumerism, basically, but also um, things about changing the way that we just sort of fall on convenience. So the big five high street banks, for example, have pumped billions into uh, fossil fuel investments, um, e even since... Um, even since COP26 in November, let alone um, Paris, the Paris Agreement in 2015. Um, so who you bank with, who your energy supplier is. So there's a lot of things that we can do just by interacting with people that we know that we know want to do something, but it's just such a minefield trying to address what you actually do. Um, and obviously with parishes, we were chatting when some people came in here that, um, earlier this evening before we started. Um, there's, a, there's a fair bit of, of stuff that parishes can do and where they do have powers from LED street lights. Um, to community energy, um, places for land, um, allotments, um, places we can do a bit of reforestation. Um, so there is quite a lot, uh, quite a lot to be done. And obviously, I know parishes are quite a mixed bag. Um, and obviously, you guys like us are all volunteers. Um, when you sit on sit on the parish, so I think it's 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 got its disadvantages, but it's also can be helpful. We found to say, look, nobody here is paid. We're all just doing this because we care. So it'd be really nice for us to start trying to team up, I think. Um, and as I say, Surrey Climate Commission are quite interested in seeing how they might be able to copy some of what we managed to do in Guildford. Um, 
So I think we sort of chatted for about half hour about, about what, what people are doing. If anybody wants to sort of chip in, this is obviously going to be, I'm going to try and facilitate this as best I can because we've got eight people in the room and um, 30 are online. So if people can put their hand up, I will try and see when when people want to chat. Um, and you'll, you'll just have to bear with me because I'm looking, I've got two screens, people here and people behind me on a screen. So I'm looking at four places at once. Um, so if we chat about what people have done and then perhaps we move on to where people think they might need help and then we can go away, ha have a bit of a think about how we might be able to facilitate some of that. I think that would be quite useful. Um, so I can see um, there's a hand up on David R's screen. Um, let me find you and unmute you. Um, ah, there you go. Go for it. Right. One thing that really strikes me is the government is going on and on about installing heat pumps in people's houses, but obviously housing stock is not ideal for heat pumps because it's not well insulated. One thing Surrey County Council and in particular all the borough councils could do is absolutely insist on all these thousands of houses that we're having built, which should be well insulated, are not fitted with gas boilers. When I challenge Taylor Wimpy, who are building in our village, why are they installing gas boilers in their properties? They said, because Guildford don't require us not to. Surely Guildford Borough Council could say all our new builds are going to be as environmentally friendly as possible, in particular gas boilers, you know, the car charger. Well, I think car charging is going to be mandatory anyway by June. But that must be a huge win over, <laughs> over the time. Is there anyone on the planning department at GBC that can speak to that? Catherine? Come on, I'm well, I'm not on the planning department in Guildford, <laughs> and I wouldn't ever want to be, to be honest. That's <laughs> bad enough. Um, uh, but what I can uh, just quickly say is, obviously, there is a strategic climate change policy in the original uh, local plan adopted in 2019. What's coming out are development management policies, um, which have just gone through a Regulation 19 uh, consultation, which means they're just about there. They've just got a few modifications left to do. And there are quite a few of us that have been really pushing to make sure that that carbon emissions target is, is hi as high as it possibly can be. I mean, we'd like it to be 40%. I certainly would like it to be 40%. Guildford have, have come down to around 31%, which is actually significantly higher than many, many other councils. And trust me, I have looked. Um, and there is plenty in the also the climate change um, supplementary planning document, locally known as an SPD. So we're actually we're not bad on policy. What we have an issue with is challenging the developers over the viability, because I get told time and time again by the planning policy team that there's only um, so much profit to go round. And if you want your 40 percent affordable homes, the developer wants 15, 20 percent profit, you want 40 percent uh, reduction in carbon emissions, uh, schools want this, that and the other, it, you know, where do you cut it from? I don't see it like that. The climate change agenda is the far greater agenda. And I am frankly appalled that the builders that have, you know, masses of profit can't actually give up. It's obviously a naive attitude that they can't actually recognise that if they don't do something about it, people won't be able to live in the houses that they're building because it will be too hot because there's no air conditioning and there's a lot of heat spots around Guildford or it will be too cold um, or there'll be an issue with the gas boilers because people won't be able to provide themselves with any heating because they can't afford to change them over in retrofitting. So I'm totally with Sue and David Reeve. Uh, you know, Guildford should be doing more. We should be holding them, um, you know, to greater account on this policy. But time and again, we are stuck because we do not have the steer from the government. Um, David Reeve, I'm sure, has got a, a point on this because David was former councillor at Guildford as well, and he was very heavily involved in the climate change agenda. And I think it would be worth the group hearing from David if, if that's okay, Ben. 
So I'm just going to pass to Gordon first, who had his hand up first and is um, Zero's uh, resident energy expert, um, one of them. Um, and then we'll come back to you, David, if that's okay. Uh, hello, Ben. Good evening. Um, and good evening, Hi. everyone. Um, just a couple of comments and reactions. So first of all, the local plan and the major developments, if you go through the SPDs, which you've just heard of, the supplementary planning documents, you will find that in that there is a requirement that those major developments are zero or low carbon in terms of heating. Um, the SPD does not mandate the technology that a big developer will use. And I've been highly involved with my Mero Residence Association teams, and this is also hooked into the group of Guildford Residence Associations, which have a collaboration, to comment on the SPDs. And um, our view there is that the, if you look at the SPDs that GBC have produced to align with the local plan, they demand currently when those major developments are built out that they are way ahead of current pathetic UK building regulations in terms of uh, insulation values, um, energy consumption and carbon emissions from the buildings. We have challenged GVC in our commentary as to whether they have the resource to police the planning applications when they come through. So Gosden Hill Farm near us in Merrow, Burfham, um, you know, there's a couple of thousand houses there. And to build those out, um, either zero carbon actually at build or enabled for the future is a really difficult problem. If we then move on to smaller developers and certainly in and around um, Mero, we see a lot of infill developments. So um, older houses knocked down, put six to 10 houses in the garden, that sort of thing. And of course, those are outside the local plan. And so they would only have to comply legally with the current building regulations, which means that they can have relatively poor insulation and gas boilers. Um, and gas boilers will still be available until it's 2035, I think, when they will no longer be available. Um, so just give you an experience of something we have been doing recently. So a local developer, I will name them because I, we have appreciated their um, preparedness to listen, Aspen Homes, um, um, making a proposal, uh, planning application, we went through that and we criticized it because the documentation suggested it was going to have gas boilers. And the um, revised planning application that went in has houses that are highly insulated and will not be connected to gas, the whole development, um, stated in writing by the developer, and whilst they may not put in mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, so going towards sort of Letty or Passive House specifications, um, they have said that they will enable the houses so they have the infrastructure so that they can be retrofitted without tearing the house apart. So things like insulation, things like um, enabling um, heat pumps in the future. Even if you put a gas boiler in today, you could actually engineer a house so it would be easy to rip out the gas boiler when its life is finished, 15 years typically for a gas boiler, and replace it with a heat pump if you had pre-engineered the solution for the building so that you could do that retrofit. So we've talked and worked closely with one developer and they seem to be responsive. The local plan mandates in the SPDs that the mega large developments um, 
are low or zero carbon in terms of the building heating. Um, how we get to the small infill developments, because I'm convinced, certainly if I just look around uh, Mero and the um, residence groups around uh, where we are now, there are a significant number of large properties, I suspect, which are unconvertible by 2050 to low carbon solutions. It cost a fortune to insulate um, large Victorian structures, for example, and almost certainly, I don't know, I don't know how, what percentage, maybe 30 or 40 percent of these large properties will be knocked down and there will be infill development springing up all over the place. And by then, those for the homes of the future and the new building regulations, they should be being built to an acceptable standard. The final comment I would make, we're still way behind some parts of uh, Europe, particularly Germany and the Netherlands. So if you look at concepts like Passive House, for example, interestingly, the most efficient buildings are not building little individual houses. It's actually putting us together in apartments with minimum external surface area and shared green space. But that isn't the British way. And I'm not sure the market wants to move in that direction. So uh, I believe that residents associations like ours certainly have an opportunity to scrutinize planning applications. I'm concerned about GBC's ability to police applications that come in because actually it gets quite complicated as well. It's much more difficult to scrutinize a developer's proposal to scrutinize the low energy and um, just look at the Debenhams replacement and the documentation associated with energy um, in that development. Really difficult job to scrutinize and see whether the developer is putting forward a cogent solution. But it can be done. Can I just make a couple of quick comments, which I think would be helpful, Ben, on that? Yeah, um, first, thank you, thank you, Gordon. I thought that was actually really interesting and, and it is a big issue. Um, I deal um, with planning applications that come through, obviously across the ward for Clandon and Horsley, but because I'm also on the parish council for West Horsley, we obviously scrutinise them in quite, uh, quite detail. Um, one of the things that I've thought um, that is actually positive from Guildford in terms of what these development management policies are going to do, but has already started on the back of that, is it doesn't matter what size your application is, um, there are different levels of of energy statements that you have to complete. And one of the things we've started to notice when we're looking at the applications is these energy statements are actually being completed by applicants regardless, even if it's an extension. Um, so I think what it's doing is it's forcing the smaller developers and you know, general people that are, you know, uh, working to extend homes and things to actually think now about what they are doing from um, a climate change agenda um, and from biodiversity as well. So it, in a way, it, it's not enough. It's never going to be enough, but it is actually something. And I think it is raising the awareness of that. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, there's a lot more that we could do. Um, and it's not just abroad. If uh, if I speak from a Guildford perspective, and I think about the spectrum, which is one of our biggest, um, I think it's our biggest energy usage, um, and yet it I, and it needs refurbishing. So you then look at Exeter, who have redone their leisure centre, passive house, so it, it, or zero carbon. I can't remember which it is. I'd have to look back. But it, it is clearly possible, and and I think that's one of the things that I always find. And I probably shouldn't say this, uh, especially as I've got some fellow councillors here. I do find it particularly frustrating with Guildford. There's always a reason why you can't do something, and that attitude needs to change. It needs to be okay. So if the government isn't helping us with this, why don't we challenge back up, and why don't we take some risks, and why don't we actually 
actually do something rather than just say we can't do this because the government because if you look around and it was the climate um, emergency UK that have all the action plans for all the different councils, local authorities, district councils, etc. There are so many things that other people are doing um, and we are really poor and I'm not putting that on Kate because Kate has just come into this and she's got two years of catch up to do because of um, some inactivity over the last couple of years. Um, so you know, I, I completely agree with what Gordon's saying. There's a lot more we can do, a lot better things we can look at. David, do you have anything to add? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you, Gordon. That was very interesting. Um, and I agreed with a lot of it, or almost all of it, actually. What, what I wanted to say, though, was that picking up Catherine's point, um, Guildford is not as good as it should be in a number of areas. Now, interestingly, if you pick up any of the committee papers on the first, on the fly sheet, on the inside or the outside, I forget which, it says loud and clear that Guildford aspires to be the best council. Not a good council, not an average council, not even an excellent council, the best council. And it is quite clear that we are not the best council in respect of moving along the agenda for um, you know, mitigate, uh, reducing carbon and so on. And I've been thinking a little bit about what to do about this. And I don't think it will ever happen in Guildford without a massive culture change in the, in the offices and possibly some of the councillors as well. But it's very difficult to actually make that happen. And one of the things that we could do is we could decide that this is an issue we could put a petition together and all lobby our friends and, and colleagues and get a substantial sized petition. We could then actually address the council at a formal council meeting. And we could say, look, we've got this big petition. You, the council, the council, council lords in the, in the general council meeting need to actually adopt a resolution that says that this is what we're going to do. And then the officers, whether they like it or not, have to do it. Now, I think that's a mechanism for moving things along a little bit. You know, I might be wrong, but I think it's worth a try. And, you know, I think the right thing to do is to try and get possibly a major issue and treat it as an example, see if we can't make some progress on a, an issue. And then perhaps we can, it can be a, a general modus operandi for pushing things through the council and getting the council to, uh, you know, force the pace, as it were, because I think, I think quite a few of the councillors, if if they are lobbied by their constituents, will probably stand a good chance of falling in line. It's worth a try, anyway. Yeah. So one thing, if people don't know, um, just sort of expand on that a little bit. Um, uh, this, I don't think this is secret knowledge. I'm going to say it anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, so the CEO of uh, Waverley, this is not secret, is it? CEO of Waverley has just also taken over as Guildford now and is operating at both. Um, and I think there's a fair bit of noise about combining um, some of the officers from both departments. And obviously Waverley is actually pretty good on climate. So I don't know if anybody knows the councillors. Um, Steve, uh, Steve Williams, who is um, of the Greens over there, and Paul Follows, who's a Lib Dem. Um, what what, what uh, God, well, what uh, Waverley did was they've got an organisation called Southwest Surrey Compass, and they actually got a lot of parties together, um, and they sat down and wrote a manifesto before they actually flipped the council back in 2019, and it was really effective because what they had already done is said, if we can manage to take control of the council, we now have a plan that we can hit the ground running, and as a result, um, they are they ranked. If you saw the survey for um, climate councils um, a couple of months ago, they actually came fifth for boroughs in the country on that. So Waverley are actually really good on climate. So I think that's definitely something quite positive. Um, the other, apart from being our closest neighbour, our twin town, obviously, Freiburg, is well renowned for being um, basically the greenest city in Europe. So I think there's sort of a, a good amount of um, leverage, exactly as you say, David, to be had there. And I think probably every, all the councillors here would probably appreciate a fair bit of public leverage being put on them so that they could be able to push that through. Of course, we come back to the issue that we don't actually have a... Uh, 
a climate officer in GBC at the moment and have been without one since um, Paul Taylor Armstrong left about six months ago, which obviously is not ideal. Um, but I think it's a, a definitely a good way to start um, sort of gathering a bit of public momentum behind some of that. So I think perhaps it's it would be a good sort of action point from someone to take away from this, if you'd think about doing that, David, to put put some wording together for that, um, for a petition for that, not, not lumbering you with a big job here. But um, whether we could think about maybe doing that and moving forward so that we could support Kate and Catherine and Diana um, in, in trying to generate a bit of political leverage to, to put onto the council officers there. I think it's, 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 it would be a good thing to come out of this, I think. Yeah, I think we need a bit of discussion to, to sort out what the, the, lead, the lead opportunity is. Which one do we go for? I mean, as I say, we can talk about gas boilers in houses. We can talk about probably one of, you know, half a dozen or more things. We need to make sure we, we adopt, if that's what we're going to do, we adopt one with a good chance of success. So can I let you maybe liaise with Catherine and Kate? Would you be happy to do that and maybe start throwing some ideas around in the past? Perhaps it seems like yeah. people are pretty keen to try and make this a bit more of a regular thing. So perhaps we could meet again in three or four weeks and, and see what, what, what the sensible proposal is for a specific um, yeah. agenda item for that and go from there. I'm happy to do that. Cool. Nice one. Um, does anyone else have a hand up? Um, yeah, of course. Sorry, who, um, do, Alan Mitchell from Shalford. Alan from Shalford, we've got here, who is a, a community. Um, we are, tomorrow we are a community council, but not a parish council. So they've changed their name um, because they found parish not necessarily that engaging for people. So they've changed the name of um, Shalford to community council. Go on. David, I quite like this idea of, can you hear me, David? I quite like this idea of petition. Um, is this going to be a petition by residents or parishes? Something that might be of good value to come from the parishes themselves or the councillors of the parish to say it's been considered in a parish council environment and they think this, or, or we think of going to residents. So the question was to repeat that. Sorry, I, I'm using a microphone here, but we're all sat fairly far apart. Um, so the question was, are you thinking about doing this from residents or would it have um, some good power to come from a team of the, all the parishes around the borough to actually have the parishes sign up to make the petition and then get more residents to sign it? But basically the, um, the underwriters of it be the parishes. That was to you, David, specifically. Yeah, I mean, I think we, it, it would only work if we got a substantially large petition. And so I think you want to pull all the levers that you've got. If that means involving the parishes, then, you know, that's that's obviously a good idea. But I think that probably means that, uh, you know, they would they would it would probably take a little longer. But to be quite honest, I think getting the result, you know, three months later is better than than launching off in a sort of half hearted way and not get achieving the result. Um, so we we um, we did a petition a while ago for a climate assembly from GBC, and actually we we got five hundred. It's five hundred signatures to be debated at full council, and we actually hit that in about um, four weeks. It was actually mm -hmm. there's so, so much support for climate action locally that it actually wasn't that difficult. So I think you know, the wording's pretty key to put it together. But I think once once that's there, it would be relatively easy to to generate enough interest to get it to full council. I think. Okay. Um, anybody else got any points, or shall we talk? Yeah, yeah. Go on, Catherine. You're, you're muted, Catherine, sorry. Mine is slightly off of that target you were just talking about. Um, while Gordon was talking about new builds, and obviously we're in Ockham and we face considerable new building around here. We also have a number of very old properties. A lot of them are grade two listed. And um, when it comes to planning, they have real issues if they want to install double glazing or any insulation. Solar panels are out of the question at the moment with GBC planners. Um, and I don't really know where people start if on an individual basis to uh, improve their own carbon emissions. So um, it's just a point that I wondered if anybody else faced the same issues. Yeah, so that's a really good point. I'm going to quickly speak to that for a second because we had been just in discussions with the university, um, Zero, Carbon Guildford and the university uh, about using Castle Cottage, uh, the castle which is in the castle grounds um, as a bit of an exemplar um, show home. Um, it's, a, it's a GBC asset. Um, 
And potentially what we could do is between the university, um, some of the expertise we have here to call on and some commercial interest is turn that into a whole house um, retrofit. And it it's not listed itself, but it is in it looks onto the castle, which is obviously a grade one listed building. And so we felt this was a really good example being owned by the council that we could say, look, here is a, a building which faces a lot of the same issues that other Guildford properties actually face. And here's some of the ways that we can actually get around it. And that's not going to apply to everything, obviously, but that is that is a big problem is, is the listed issue um, in, in places like Guildford. So if we could find an exemplar house that we could use that for, um, then it would potentially be a, a pretty good way forward to do some of that. Um, the response so far has not been very positive. Um, the, the main uh, vote for the moment is to turn it into another cafe, um, which seems not the ideal way forward um, for that. Um, and then the alternative was potentially to use a council house, but obviously doing it in a council house is not the same issue. And the problem you then have is that no one in a council house is going to be able to afford 15 to 20 grand on retro retrofitting it anyway. So it doesn't actually, actually address the challenge that the people who could retrofit their house are going to face. Um, so I think we, we, we would potentially have don't some have that sort of budget anyway. A lot of them are very old and they live in very old houses. Uh, and I, I mean, obviously, there are some grants, but if you're going to do a, some sort of retrofit, I think you've got to make it economically viable for the majority rather than just because it's grade two listed doesn't mean you're wealthy when you live in it. So, yeah, so it's not so much that it's just the issue that it doesn't necessarily mean you're wealthy to live in. It's just that a lot of properties within Guildford face that issue, basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think the, the sort of main point on it is finding this exemplar that we could use different um, different different stakeholders to come in and turn it into something. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we had Catherine, then Candice. Yeah, I, did, I was just going to say, uh, and I don't know if Anthony Etwell made it into Zero Carbon Guildford. He might be in the room with you. Um, he there. is? Yeah, uh, he might not want to say anything. Um, but um, Anthony has uh, particularly is a little contentious at the moment with the Guildford planners, and I won't say why. Um, so Anthony has put forward, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, he, he's going to have to wave at you to tell me to stop if he wants me not to say anything. He says it's fine. Good. OK, so Anthony lives in East Torsley um, and he uh, has put in a planning application for um, a new house for him and his um, family to move into behind his current house, which is a listed building. And it is an eco friendly house and it is the first one that we would have in Guildford. And it's um, been done, I mean, it's absolutely brilliant, all the ideas in there. And one of the things that I talked to Anthony about is when you are looking, um, if you go into the planning portal, for example, and you're thinking of doing an extension, you get lots of ideas for where you need planning permission and what you can do. And what would be brilliant is if we had this model house, um, a model eco house, so that if people, like Catherine was saying, if people did want to um, retrofit or do different things or know what they can do to um, make their house either zero carbon or reduce the emissions, Anthony's home, if he doesn't mind me saying, is, is potentially what that model might look like. Now, at the moment, Anthony's home is going to be going to the planning committee for decision because I'm not telling you what Guildford's response was to this because, um, yeah, it technically could be seen as infilling, but I, I don't think it is. So we'll have that debate, obviously, at a future planning committee and hopefully Anthony will um, get his house, at which point I really am going to get into trouble. So, um, but this was the kind of thing, you know, if we've got an example of what you could do, a bit like you were talking, Ben, about Castle Cottage, you know, th this for me is a really good idea that, that just you know, the average person can say, right, I would really like to do something in my home. It's a bit like Harry Eve has put in uh, into the chat about draft exclusion. I'm not sure I'd use masking tape, but because the paint would all come off. But, you know, there's lots of ideas in the way that you can do things, but it's not that accessible. People don't know where to go. And of course, not everybody is online, you know, if you are looking at, at uh, different things. So lots to think about there. And, and apologies to Anthony if he, if he wanted to describe his house or share his plans at a later date. I'm sure he will. I think he's going to start selling tickets from your from your description. <laughs> Claw back some of their retrofit money. Uh, 
Candice. You're muted. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, to me, environmental issues quite often focus on um, biodiversity and recycling and um, those kinds of issues. And I was really glad that you mentioned um, microgeneration and um, in, because we obviously need to replace the hydrocarbons that we're using. Um, a lot of people seem to think that electricity comes out of the wall, but obviously it doesn't. It has to be generated in some way. And um, I myself tried um, a microgeneration project at our property, which is an old water mill. And when we moved in 15 years ago, we have a, a big sluice. We had a project um, we could put in a micro um, electric turbine on it. And um, Obviously, the Environment Agency had to be uh, contacted and their answer was, oh, we want to reduce, we want to remove all the uh, barriers on the River Tillingbourne. Uh, we want salmon to be able to migrate back to the headwaters, you know, which they probably haven't for 600 years. And I said, well, what about climate change? Oh, well, we don't see that the fish have been affected by climate change. And, and really, that was it. We, that, that was the end of it. So more recently, um, you know, we were very upset by that. Obviously, we didn't feel it was the right decision. Um, but more recently, I've been looking at putting in a water source heat pump. So once again, the Environment Agency are involved. So I went to their website and the page that I was looking at for water source heat pumps, I think it was last updated about six years ago, um, which I find quite shocking um, that there's nothing more recent. And there was a contact, you know, this is strictly for people doing microgeneration projects. And it took them three or four weeks to even get back to me. And, you know, it, it's that kind of attitude that, I find so disappointing. You know, we have to get out of this mess together and we need to have that backup to enable us to do so. And I just don't feel that the support is there. And, you know, I'm, I'm so hopeful that we will get something um, completed. But, you know, it, it was a real struggle the first time and I can see it being exactly the same this next time. So it, it was just really... You know, we need to be able to move on from hydrocarbons somehow. And if we're not enabled to do that, then we are stuck in this situation. I'm sorry, that's a very negative message. But, uh, you know, that's how I, that's been my experience. Thanks, Candice. Uh, Patricia? Um, I'm Patricia Allen, um, St Martha Parish Council. Um, a completely different subject, um, electric car chargers. Um, is there any advice out there from other parish councils or Guildford Borough Council about where parish councils could think about locating these, the cost of them? Um, could we pull some ideas on this? Um, we, so we've got um, in the room here, Stuart, who works community asset financing. Is that a way to describe it? Uh, so he does a lot of, hang on, let, let me see if I can actually get, do you want to come sit closer yeah. to the mic, Stuart? Sorry, so we're playing musical um, Yeah, so my, I, I actually live in St Martha's, uh, I'm not an officer of the Parish Council, but uh, in my professional life I'm involved in the whole uh, financing sustainability, particularly EV. Um, and I don't know if you know, but the government last week uh, announced a huge uh, spending plan uh, for EV charging infrastructure, and they actually published a paper this morning, which is a more detailed version of that. Um, and one, one thing that slightly concerns me is, is, is that there's a, a bunch of money being allocated to local authorities and obviously down to down through the chain to to uh, councils, etc. And I haven't really heard anything about whether Surrey and then I guess through Guildford and through to the parishes is actually getting that money. There's a pilot scheme. But these these um, th this funding is critically important um, because it's been used for two reasons. One is um, in terms of actual charging points, one of the key costs is actually the connection cost to the grid. And depending where you are, that connection cost could vary massively. So one of the big parts of the funding is to try and even that out. The second is just 
to try and um, give rural communities um, EV charging that they couldn't afford otherwise because of the, the, the lack of utilisation. So the one thing I, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how, how it works, but I just haven't heard anything tonight about anyone. At, I'm sorry, this is not a criticism at all, but it's just an observation about whether anyone in Guildford or in Surrey is actually trying to get um, proportionate money. And then the other thing I would say is that um, a number of councils have uh, done community funding. So Islington has done a community fund for infrastructure charging. Um, and similar on the on the solar on the community energy scheme, uh, West Barks, for example, have done community schemes. And in, in wealthy uh, areas like this, it is actually possible to raise money from communities to fund projects. Um, and there are ways. To, and I, haven't, I haven't heard anything really about this. And that's the kind of thing that worries me is about the kind of broader ability to put these kind of financing packages together. So um, today I went to. Um... So as I say, I started work at Surrey County Council three days ago, so I, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert here, but I went to a um, like roadshow thingy this morning for environment, transport and infrastructure. And one of the display setups was about on-street um, EV charging. So I'm happy to take that away as an action point because I can't remember exactly how much they said they were applying for. Um, in, there was there was a map of some proposed areas in Guildford, uh, which I took a picture of, but it was mostly focused in the town centre. So I'm happy to go away and chat um, to someone there. And then next time we meet, I can report back on what the actual plan is via SCC, because obviously they hold most of the mandate for transport. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to um, try and chat about that unless Kate knows. Um, no, I'll give you some names. Cool, okay, nice one. And me and Kate will try and deal with that and see see what, what sort of plan we can get. And then, um, yeah, maybe have, bring it up at the next one. We've got a bit more concrete information, if that's all right. Ben, can I just say, we've got an excellent um, guy in uh, East Horsley who's part of the joint task group, uh, Alex Braze. Anthony can give you his details um, before he leaves. And he was um, willing to look at it at, for our local parishes, because this was what I was saying right at the start. You know, there's no point us all trying to do this in isolation. We need to know very much what, um, you know, was just said about St. Martha's. What are the grants available? There's no point us all going off and trying to do different things. It's economies of scale. So I think, I think Alex would really love to get involved because he's quite passionate about this. And I think it could be a really good help for you. Cool, okay, perfect. Um, yeah, that would be ideal if each parish starts trying a different pilot of something, we could get somewhere a lot quicker, really, couldn't we? Um, Francis. Hello. Um, <coughs> sorry, I'm, I'm, I tested positive for COVID myself, so I'm a bit worse for wear. Um, but we mentioned getting um, an EV charging station set up by some of the parishes. I was wondering if you also were looking similarly into um, a like community bus programs or a bike rentals or things like that, that could help maybe with that, that difference between like the, the access, difference in access to things between rural areas and urban areas. Um, so Mole Valley are currently trying, I think you might know this Francis, but Mole Valley are currently trialing um, uh, on-demand buses. Um, I forget what, anybody remember what PPTB or something is it called? I can't remember. Um, I think it starts next week. Um, I think there's a bit of a um, a bit of a balance in how economically viable they are because obviously if you're calling up the bus, then it depends kind of how many times it stops as to whether um, and whether it's council run. And there's obviously also the issues with them selling the routes um, to places. Does anybody know much about any of that? No one in the room does. Um, that's another thing I can chat with. Uh, Catherine's got a hand up. God, I, re I really, I will be quiet, honestly. Um, but one of the things I find quite fascinating about this is the um, one of the latest big applications allocated sites for West Horsley. Uh, Surrey County Council put a, a, a pitch in for um, S106 money. Um, and it was this uh, on-demand bus from the most ruralist point um, in, in West Horsley on the opposite end of where Diana lives, I hasten to add, because she is definitely in the most rural, but this was on the far side near the Wisley roundabout to actually put in this on-demand bus. Um, and effectively it's dial -a ride isn't it? You know, that's what we're talking about. But, you know, in a completely unsustainable location, and it goes back to what you're saying, Ben, about how many stops and, and how is, where is it gonna come from? So I'd, I, it needs thinking about in terms of how they are gonna connect up and how people are actually gonna access these. 
because if you're waiting to get to the station at six o'clock in the morning and you're dialing your bus, I don't think it's going to turn up here. Sorry, I'm very sceptical. I'll do a bit of digging into that as well um, and see if I can get some sort of um, information about by the time we meet next day, it, it, they may have launched more rally. Um, Catherine. Um, yes, on that. Other Catherine. Cobham, Cobham does have the chatter bus, which I think is um, privately funded and it's doing very well. We have asked if it could come through Ockham and apparently it can't. Um, but my other point is, um, would these buses be electric buses? Because if I they're going to be, be really diesel so I think petrol. In interestingly, Stuart, who's here, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Stuart, but you help finance an electric bus which goes from one end, community finance. Yeah, I, I did some stuff in Brighton. I mean, the, the, sorry, without going about it, the big problem is that the government, um, it only worked on, on um, grant funding. And then over the last year, the government changed the grant funding and they just something called Zebra, which I won't bore you with the details, but they've allocated all the funding to some very big projects like Coventry to go electric bus. It's gone to all the big companies. So now, um, you know, electric buses are about half, £500,000 each, roughly. Um, so the small operators can't really afford to buy electric buses. The grants were 50%. So the whole, the whole, this is what I'm saying, the, the, the problem is, is that the whole government funding um, is, is a very political decision, but it's actually a very important decision to engage very early. Um, because, you know, if you lose that money, it's very difficult to, to recapture. So at the moment, um, to be honest with you, all very difficult for a private operator to buy an electric bus. I mean, some of the smaller ones are cheaper than 500,000, but, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't afford it. And what they did was it, it ran from one end of the... Uh, one supermarket to another. Yeah. yeah, car park at one end, of, uh, sorry, a supermarket car park at one end of Brighton to the other. So it didn't really create any new, uh, didn't need any new infrastructure. So it's just the cost of a bus. Um, but I mean, a, a, an electric minibus, surely, if you were doing on demand, would potentially be... But they're quite ex they're expensive. You see, the problem is yeah. it, it, most, it, most hard assets, so cars or buses are actually more expensive currently. The cost is coming down. The big player in the bus world is Zenobi, who do obviously the, the Guildford electric glide buses mm. again you know but they're, they're you know they're, they're they're choosing they're a commercial organization so they're choosing what they do uh, for obvious reasons so you know it, it, it's it's quite hard um economically to simply go and buy an electric acid at the moment they're still um, so, they're still so empty though aren't they that's the disappointing thing exactly if they scale it down it exactly. would be more affordable when it would actually be exactly more used up. yeah i mean so yeah so we'll see but you know, i mean you know we are seeing companies more and more step up and decide that they need to buy electric vehicles like minibuses and actually putting pressure on the big organizations locally that you know ferry people from the station to to you know to the to the sites and getting them to buy electric transportation because they can afford it they've got the corporate ability to do it as part of their corporate image that's maybe one of the key things to actually do is put pressure on those organizations that can fund it themselves as well yeah um so one thing I'm quite interested in to see what people's thoughts are is um, uh, there's a chap called Jeff Duck who is um, on the Surrey Climate Commission um, and he is chair of Caterham Village Hall um, and they're obviously what everyone's suffering with the energy crisis at the moment with bills going up ridiculously um, and they are really struggling to pay the bills on the um, on the village hall. And I'm wondering whether anyone else is sort of having similar issues with that, bearing in mind, obviously, there's quite a few parishes here, which I guess look after village halls on whether it would be something useful to um, try and get a bit of advice around that on retrofitting, on energy. Um, a lot of the time, obviously, they end up with domestic systems because people, the people trying to put, put stuff in don't necessarily know what the best way forward is. So they take advice that might not always be the best advice. Um, so I'm wondering whether looking at village halls is, is, a, is a potential way that would be helpful and might help cut impact, which might also get um, some some community members behind it as well and start building a bit of momentum behind it. Does anybody think that would be useful or not particularly? Got a thumbs up from Patricia. Um, David. To me. Um, just to say the East Horsey Village Hall is heated by heat pumps, has been for... Ooh, 10 more years or 15 so they might be worth talking to it's a bit it's yeah, a very big job. hall do you know how they funded that um no but it was it is quite a, i mean a new building i say it's probably 30 35 years old but um they've put three um borehole things i think isn't it mm, so right. it is worth speaking to east horsey management committee or whoever i don't know i, I wouldn't know who to know but uh, just to say that that is done by heat pumps 
Nice one, yeah, because I think what would be really helpful and one thing that we're trying to do here actually with some of the funding that we've got, we just not really had capacity to start chatting about it yet, is um, case studies of a lot of this stuff because obviously you would, I think it would really help for people to know what the pitfalls are, what the successes are. Mm. And between a lot of the people here, we've got... Um, well, we've got EVs, we've got ground source, air source, heat pumps. We've got people who have, who have got that, but then have just <coughs> taken all their floors up to insulate between them all, um, so that they stop, so they lose less heat out the out the um, out their floors on their suspended um, floors downstairs. So I think if we could get some case studies going on that side of things as well, it might really help guide people in the right direction, see what can be done and what's what's maybe a bit of a red herring. So I could, I could probably and he's told me he'll be up to date on how that works. Cool. I'm pretty sure it's ground source. Okay, yeah, ground source apparently. He's supposed to be, so we're going to... Cool, going to check in with Nick, the parish clerk there. Um, cool, anybody, it's um, it's quarter past eight. Um, John's got a point, I think. Should we try and wrap up by 8.30ish um, um, and then potentially before that chat about when we might next meet? Because I think there seems to be a fair bit of momentum building for meeting again. Um, John, go for it. Hello there, I'm John Oliver from Save Story Countryside. Um, what I'd like to hear some views on is about visitor pressure on our green spaces out in the parishes. Um, because we all know what's happened during the COVID pandemic. There has been a lot of environmental degradation as a result of it. Um, but now that that's kind of passing, the, the, that pressure is passing. We still have Surrey County Council trying to encourage as many people as possible out into the countryside on the grounds of um, improving physical and mental health. However, um, last Tuesday, I asked a question at Cabinet uh, to say, well, that's fine. However, the number of people who are going out into the countryside now is putting pressure on the local communities. Um, has any assessment been done of the mental of mental health as a result of those pressures? Um, and actually, the, I got a load of verbiage in the response, but they didn't actually answer the question. Um, uh, but what they did do, tag on at the end, is say, "Well, if you've got any ideas about this, or if you've got any information about this, let us know." So they were passing the book back to me. Um, what I'd like to know if there are any views from the parishes as to how people are, shall we say, suffering as a result of visitor pressures. Um, because I, I think that what we need to do is to put a lot more emphasis on greening our urban environments. Um, because um, if we have street trees, that's going to provide shade and reduce the heat island effect. Um, if we try and get people to use the gardens more and provide trees in the gardens, we provide shade into the street for other people, all of these sort of things. Um, rather than encouraging people out into the countryside, which is putting pressure on our environment, on our ecosystems. So it'd be good to hear from the parishes um, what, what's happening out there, what their residents feel about this increase in visit and numbers. Did everybody hear that? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, uh, Catherine and Patricia. Okay, just, uh, yeah, it, it's a really difficult situation, isn't it, John? You know, um, there is no doubt, uh, it's hard to measure, but there is no doubt that getting out into the countryside, getting out for a, a, a walk, particularly now that people, a lot of people are working at home, you, you know, you have to get out and get some of that fresh air and vitamin D and everything. Um, but of course, it is going to put pressure on the countryside, on our footpaths and everything. So very... A dilemma I guess. Um, from a planning point of view one of the things that is particularly good is the uh, new national design guide um, has actually got criteria in there that um, uh, planning planners should be looking at about street, street lining, um, tree lining streets, new so new developments say for example Wisley if it ever come you know when it comes forward there should be um, tree-lined streets as well so very much um, green community space um, public open space tree lining um, Surrey themselves have obviously done uh, quite a lot for parish councils recently I think most of us have probably took up the offer of a um, hundred uh, 
new trees, little whips, admittedly, they come through as sticks. Um, but, you know, again, encouraging tree planting. And I know there are quite a few villages, our own included, that have done initiatives around, um, you know, planting a tree, not just as part of the Queen's um, green canopy, but, you know, generally to re-green the village. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it, it's difficult. It's a bit of a dilemma because we do need people to be able to go out and value the countryside. And if anything, I think one of the positive benefits of that is that people, you know, have a greater appreciation of how valuable that is and what is out there in terms of biodiversity, because we, you know, we mustn't forget about our wildlife and how important our natural environment is. So, you know, a positive is that I feel that there is a greater appreciation, you know, that our local next door site, which is like the old Facebook, isn't it? You know, there's lots of pictures of sunsets of um, moths that people have been that have seen they don't know what they are so that awareness is growing but of course we have to be careful because we you don't want that at the detriment of what is already out there so very good point but I don't know how you measure it I'm afraid <laughs> sorry Patricia? um just to say I think this is a real problem I see it at Blackheath which is part of part in Waverley and part in Guildford. And one of the pressures on the village is the parking. There's not enough parking and all these cars are just coming and, and parking absolutely everywhere, parking on the edge of the heathland, um, making it pretty unpleasant for um, local inhabitants. Um, and also, I mean, there are other areas like St Martha's, hill um that's also had huge pressure you've got off-road bikers who are absolutely making incredible jumps and having those what for themselves and and ruining you know ruining footpaths and ruining areas and they've got this problem on leith hill winterfold all over the place and i think it is a very very difficult problem one of the things is the surrey hills partnership has advertised Surrey Hills till it's blue in the face and people are, are coming in their droves and they're not necessarily, some are local people, some are coming to walk their dogs from other villages and they're all driving there rather than walking to these spots, which is one of the things perhaps we should be encouraging people where possible to actually walk to these spots rather than just get in their car to go half a mile with their dogs. I think that's one point. Um, the other thing is there are people coming from London and you know further afield to actually walk in the wonderful North Downs, don't know what you do about that. But I certainly think we're going to get to a point where it's going to be rather difficult to sustain it um, mm. in terms of parking, in terms of the bridleways, the footpaths, the mm. condition of the countryside, the wildlife. We have some very rare wildlife at Blackheath, really difficult to keep night jars nesting, Dartford warblers, etc. when all these people are coming and inundating the place and you get hundreds and hundreds of people coming every day and at weekends you probably get thousands several thousand so it, it's a very very difficult thing and i do think it's something that we need to be very aware of and probably there needs to be a serious conversation about it with all the parties concerned yeah and I, actually i think that probably is a good way to start building a bit of collaboration among people um in, in smaller communities so we, we live right by avenger hammer um uh, uh, village green and um, people just go into the woods and use it as the toilet not just for a week um, and we've been walking um, up in the roughs and we came back down and people were parked all along the road under the clock tower and one of the residents who lives there when we walked down was shoveling horse manure onto all the cars that were parked alongside the, uh, the road <laughs> so not speaking as the chair of a charity here but there's a potential solution that you could raise to, um, to local residents can I, can, I just, can I just say there is, a, to me, that, that there is a social element to this as well, because, um, you know, what we've got are people going out into the countryside. That means either rail fares or driving a car, whatever. It's a cost. Um, therefore, people who can't afford to do that are still in the towns. And that's, that is why I believe that greening the towns has got to have more focus, because that means that... Um, as I, as I said in my question to Surrey County Council, that everyone will have um, this available to them all of the time. But, you know, and it's just, um, it sounds like a, a no brainer to me that if we can get people to, if we can get people to 
stay in the towns, but get the effects that you get from greening, then um, the countryside is relieved of the pressure and the biodiversity is relieved of the pressure. Yeah, sure. Cheers, John. Okay, let's go uh, Candice, Beverly, and then um, wrap up. Um, can I pass on to Beverly because she's far more qualified than I am and we're the same parish council. <laughs> sure. Okay. Thank you, Candice. We're both on Shear Parish Council. <laughs> And I've just been framing the uh, parish council's response to the government's landscape review. And if you are familiar with this, um, two main things, refocusing how we look after protected lands, that, so that's AONBs and national parks. And the first aim now, priority number one, is to drive nature's recovery. In the same document, they say it's still saying that the second aim is to encourage all members of our society to engage with the local environment. And as I've heard other speakers say, these two are not compatible because Shear have certainly have so much increased footfall during uh, the COVID lockdown and it's like a message has gone out, come out to the Surrey Hills and trash it. So I feel that we should all, as parish councils, you've got a few more days to respond to the government's landscape review. And I think it's very important that we do that to make it clear that the other thing that comes out of the review is that the, the feeling is that um, the oversight the management teams for AONBs are weak. And one of the things that I would ask for is in a change of, of priorities, that the first aim now is to drive nature recovery, that the teams who look after A and B should have appointments who make that their first aim. At the moment, the first aim seems to be drive, pe driving people out to the countryside. They are welcome, but only if we can get over to them the message they must respect the countryside. Thanks, Beverly. So I've just put the link to the page for the review in the chat. So if you, it will obviously disappear. Um, so if you click on it now for those who are in Zoom, um, then you'll be able to do that this evening. What I'll do if everybody's okay is I will send the follow up email. Uh, with that link um, in it to all 50 people that signed up for this evening. Yes, please. With a bit of an explainer of what it is, because obviously we've not had um, 17 or 18 people come. Um, I think, and I think that's probably a good place to wrap it up, unless anybody's got any burning point that they want to raise. Um, but should we, what do people think? Should we potentially schedule something further again towards the end of next month? Um, a few of us have got action points to take away. Um, so I think it'd be good rather than just sort of like go away from here thinking that was a, a worthwhile chat and then not do anything about it for three months. Should we meet again in a month and maybe try and bring some more people in? I know Ripley, um, Jim from Ripley is quite keen to try and get involved in doing stuff. So perhaps if we could all reach out to one or two people, um, start bringing some more folks in and I'll just send a little summary through of what we've chatted about tonight. Um, does that seem like a fairly sensible plan? Yeah, seeing a bit of nodding. I'm going to do it anyway. I'll just do it on the assumption that it's fine. <laughs> Definitely do it. I'm not doing it. You can do it, Ben. <laughs> no worries. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, and I think if you want anything, um, to come back out of that. I've recorded most of it, so you can drop me an email. Uh, it's ben at zerocarbonguildford.org. Um, if anybody wants anything done um, from Surrey County Council, I will try my best to try, uh, as I say, three days in, so don't expect too much, but I see this as a big part of what I'm going to be trying to do, getting in there and um, pestering for stuff to happen. So, um, yeah, please do feel free to get in contact. And, um, yeah, let's all um, – I'll send out a message to everyone who signed up about when the next one will be, but I'll aim again for the end of um, uh, April, and we'll go from there. Thanks, Ben. Thank you for hosting it. Thanks very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank, Thank you. Cheers, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.